It is a global peacekeeper's fantasy, being able to predict where violence will break out across the world so he or she knows where to look and target his or her resources accordingly. Jay Ulfelder is a consultant for the Center for the Prevention of Genocide at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. And he's working to make that dream a reality for both governments and the average citizen. And he joins us now for more from the American capital. Jay, it's good of you to be with us. I, I must confess, the line of work that you're in seems uh, very odd and exotic. Can you tell us how one becomes a forecaster of global conflict? Yeah, I, I think it is odd and exotic. I'm not sure I, my, uh, I, I don't know, really know anybody else who's doing this, uh, at least in the same way I am. I, I essentially stumbled into this work um, finished a PhD in political science in 1997, and I didn't have an academic job. Um, needed to look for work, and uh, I'm originally from the Washington area, so moved back here with my wife. Um, and I worked in a couple of kind of related jobs, uh, if, and then unrelated jobs, doing some freelance journalism. Well, let me ask you about the industry. related jobs, because <laughs> I gather for a decade yeah. you were research director at the U.S. government's Political Instability Task Force. What did you have to do as yeah. part of that work? Yeah, that was, uh, that's where I finally got lucky and got a job that uh, let me bite into something really substantive with the, the training I had. Um, we were uh, essentially uh, being paid by the U.S. government. This was a panel of academics from uh, institutions primarily around the U.S. Um, using open source data to try to develop statistical models that could forecast different forms of uh, bad political things happening essentially uh, in countries around the world a year to two years out. So I was uh, sort of managing and overseeing and, and conducting uh, research for that group. And let's get more specific now. Your work uh, through the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. has you working on a web-based a web system to forecast mass atrocities. Explain to us what yeah. exactly you're doing. We are, uh, there are a couple of parts to it from a technical perspective, but in a larger sense, we're trying to build a system, as you said, to uh, provide uh, global forecasting of uh, mass violence, deliberate violence directed against civilians. Um, the, you know, the point of this program is, is prevention. Uh, we, we believe that better early warning uh, creates more opportunities for prevention, so we're trying to essentially take the best available forecasting methods and apply them specifically to the problem of, uh, of anticipating mass atrocities. There have been other efforts to do uh, early warning and forecasting on this topic, but a lot of it's kind of ad hoc, reacting to, to conflict that's underway, uh, or um, forecasting efforts that weren't necessarily using the best available methods. So we're really trying to, to focus specifically on mass atrocities and bring the, the best available methods to the problem. Um, for us, that means a couple of things. We're doing statistical risk assessments, so building uh, a set of statistical models and then taking the forecast from them and averaging them that look at all countries of the world at least once a year, uh, and then using a sort of wisdom of expert crowd system uh, as a, a kind of complement to that, where we have a large pool or hopefully large pool of um, people with subject matter expertise or regional expertise who we basically ask, you know, how likely do you think uh, certain events we're concerned about are in a, in a time frame we're focused on, and, uh, and update those forecasts as we go to give a sort of live readout on what this pool of experts thinks, where the risks are, and how those are changing over time. Well, let's see if we can figure this out even further. What are the different techniques that forecasters such as yourself might use when assessing yeah. risk level? Yeah, I think the, the two I just mentioned are, are uh, two of the main tools, so statistical risk assessment and then this, this wisdom of expert crowds uh, component is, is a newer one, um, but there's a lot of ongoing research uh, right now uh, demonstrating that it actually works pretty well. We, we, individual experts tend not to be so good at this problem of forecasting, but it turns out if you average uh, forecasts across a bunch of them, you can get a pretty good read, uh, even on hard topics like mass atrocities or other geopolitical events. Um, some forecasters also use uh, formal models, game theoretic models that kind of represent a certain kind of situation or problem. 
uh, and you might, uh, you know, then what essentially varies in those cases is what are the inputs, you know, what are the sort of interests and values well, that's what of I'm getting at. players. Let me jump in, the in there on that because, yeah. for example, if obviously if there's a political assassination, presumably that's an input. If there's a drought in the country, right. presumably that's an input. What other things like that are you looking for? Yeah, those may be. And so part of one of the reasons I, I tend to use statistical modeling most often, and one of the reasons is because it allows us to kind of answer empirically that question of which are the factors we ought to be most concerned about. So with um, forecasting uh, violent political conflict on kind of a large scale, um, some the, the sort of most fundamental things are just the population size of a country, but then also uh, more particularly ec levels of economic development. Um, and there, I've actually found that, um, and many of us have, that uh, infant mortality rates turn out to be an especially sensitive indicator, more so than a country's gross domestic product, for example, uh, because it picks up not just how wealthy a country is, but also some things about how that wealth is being spent and uh, issues of inequality and the like. Um, Features of a country's political institutions, so how democratic or authoritarian is it, uh, and, and some sort of details on that, uh, how polarized politics is becoming, um, aspects of uh, sort of how ethnicity relates to politics, not just that there are ethnic groups, but whether they're uh, sort of formally excluded from politics, um, you know, distributions of natural resources, uh, how the economy is performing recently. Um, so there, those are the kinds of things that we tend to look at. Uh, but again, one of the nice things about doing statistical modeling is we can put those things in a model and get it from the historical evidence some clearer sense of which of them matter more than the others and how much we ought to weight them in our thinking about where the risks are. Sure. I, I, I almost resist asking this question, but I think I kind of have to, and that is once you put all of those inputs in and you're looking at the globe, uh, what region yeah. and or countries are at the top of the list? Yeah. The, well, the work I'm doing right now, uh, f again, for, the, for this uh, project for the uh, Center for the Prevention of Genocide, there we're focusing not on conflict in a general sense, but more specifically on, uh, on, on risks of mass atrocities. And there, the regions that really pop out right now are uh, South Asia uh, and uh, sort of a band of countries across uh, northern Central Africa. Um, so in South Asia, uh, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, um, uh, India actually uh, turns out to be relatively high risk, and Sri Lanka, um, Iraq as well. Uh, and then moving into Africa, a band of countries from uh, Uganda and Rwanda actually turns out, uh, according to our modeling, to still be relatively high risk for these kinds of things. Uh, Ethiopia, and Somalia, and then moving through uh, Central Africa. Now, they're, they're, one of the things I should have noted up front, there, there are a number of countries where this is happening already, including ones in those regions, uh, of course. So um, places like Syria, Sudan, South Sudan, and the Central African Republic. Um, well, you know what? Uh, Everybody who follows the yeah. news, I think, would, you know, you, you've put out a pretty good list of countries right there. And I suspect if you follow the news, you would say, well, of course. Uh, yeah. I guess what I wonder is, is there, is there a region or a country on your list yeah. uh, which, you know, you wouldn't expect to see on that list? Right, right. Yeah, that's really, I think, the, where the statistical uh, or this kind of risk, this kind of forecasting in general can be most powerful is looking for the cases that seem to be more counterintuitive. Um, India was what I mentioned. I think when people are, you know, you might think of it as a place for violent conflict, but not necessarily for the kind of mass atrocities I was describing. Mm -hmm. uh, in West Africa, um, uh, Guinea and Guinea-Bissau both stand out. Guinea's one that's just not, I think, really on the part of the conversation around atrocities prevention right now. Um, but that uh, that's a, a country that our modeling suggests ought to be uh, there ought to be more attention to it. Um, Uganda again, I th you know, so. Uh, Burundi's getting a lot of attention right now as a place with the upcoming elections where the risks of violence against civilians seem to be escalating. Our modeling suggests it's not necessarily so high risk, whereas nearby Uganda is, and that's not a case that's getting as much attention. So that's really what we want to try to do with these models is, uh, is highlight the cases that, aren't, uh, that we aren't paying as much attention to now and try to get more, more attention focus there, again, 
in hopes of spurring preventive efforts. Okay, let me read something here that a professor of political science at the University of North Texas wrote, uh, I guess in the middle of 2013, and then get you to comment on it. Uh, he wrote, uh, what level of precision is needed before making life and death decisions? If it is foretold that there is an 80% chance that North Korea will attack the South in the next year, is this sufficient to launch a preemptive strike? Is 95% or 99% confidence a better benchmark? Decisions based upon beliefs about the future always have a degree of uncertainty associated with them, but there's no clear ethical standard for assessing the trade-off between thousands of lives and the risk of being on the wrong side of the probability distribution. And this gets to the issue about how comfortable you are knowing that governments will take your information and make military decisions on the basis of that information when, in effect, nothing is 100% and you're dealing with probabilities, obviously. What do you say to that? Yeah, I, I, he's right. There, it's not a, uh, in the sense that it's not a clear, um, an area where we've talked a lot about the ethics of this. I think, I think as forecasters, we have an ethical obligation, first of all, to be clear that we can't give precise forecasts on violent conflict. There will be a lot of uncertainty around those. We're not at a point with this kind of analysis where we can say, uh, you know, here's where the next conflict's going to be, and I can, uh, can tell you with great confidence uh, where that is, and therefore, um, it, you know, this is what you ought to do in response to that. But the flip side of that is that uh, organizations, whether it's governments or other organizations, are making planning decisions and do have to make those choices. Um, so the way I look at it, we have an ethical obligation to give them the best information we can uh, about where the risks are, uh, again, along with being uh, appropriately circumspect about how reliable the forecasts we give them are. And we do know um, from uh, extensive research on forecasting that uh, just having them ask kind of the most uh, convenient country experts or sitting around a table and talking about where they think the risks are, are not very reliable ways to get that information. Doing things like statistical modeling or the kinds of aggregated uh, wisdom of crowds thing I was talking about or other sort of using formal techniques that kind of discipline your process of assessing risks um, will give you better information. It's not going to be perfect and uh, it's going to be far from perfect, but it will be better than kind of the status quo practice that, that's conventionally used. Better than punditry? Um, so the way I see it, yeah, yeah, essentially, right. Uh, or, or the kind of... Um, you know, the kind of deference to expertise that I think is the way we often do things like this. You know, if you're concerned about what's happening in, uh, in Ethiopia, the, the default is to ask the person who you think knows the most about Ethiopia. And that person's going to have a lot of really valuable information for a lot of things. But we know from research on forecasting, they won't necessarily uh, and often won't be a terribly accurate forecaster of the risk of civil war in Ethiopia. It'd be better to ask a crowd of people who know something about Ethiopia and something about civil wars or use a model that can sort of more objectively weigh the evidence and compare it across a large number of cases. So if we believe we can get not perfect but better than the status quo forecast by using these techniques, I actually think we kind of have uh, the ethical obligation to do that work and try to provide the best information possible given that the stakes are so high. Sure, I see that. Just wondering though, for example, if we were having this conversation, let's say for argument's sake, a year ago, would you at yeah. some point in the conversation have said to me, you know, the Central African Republic looks like it's about to blow? Yeah, that case actually was um, one that our statistical modeling, which we had done uh, in early 2013, identified as at high risk of, uh, of mass atrocities. Um, and then we asked a question of our pool of experts about it who immediately identified it as a, an extremely high risk case um, starting, uh, we started that system in the fall, so that's when we were asking it. So that happens to be a case where our forecasts using the methods I was talking about would have been quite accurate. Um, Syria is one where we probably wouldn't have been as accurate with the models I, uh, I'm, I'm working with now. Um, so it's not going to be perfect. Uh, and, you know, again, I, I think that it's also part of our ethical obligation to be clear about that. Mm. Um, but again, I think what we'll see using these kinds of techniques is over time we'll tend to give better information and, uh, and that's a better place for those decision makers to be. It's also, you know, I don't think anybody's out there, and this is a good thing, I don't think anybody in the military out there is 
saying, give me the numbers and then I'll press the button kind of thing. Uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad we don't live in that world. Uh, but this, you know, these forecasts are just one piece of information among many they're considering. Uh, and so giving them one somewhat better piece of information, I think, is a good thing. And I guess you have to worry about what you folks in the trade call the black swans. What are they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, the, I mean, I think the formal definition of that is, you know, these sort of lo uh, very low probability, hard to anticipate, but high impact kinds of events. Um, in a sense, all of the kinds of forecasting I'm working on come close to that. I think uh, uh, Taleb also used the phrase gray swans for events where um, they may be somewhat more predictable, but are still rare and hard to get a handle on. I think that's more like a lot of what we're doing. Um, even at the level of civil wars, as academics usually define them, we only see a few uh, new civil wars start around the world uh, each year. So these are really rare events. They're already just kind of inherently close to, to black swan territory, uh, which again is, is part of what makes it hard, uh, this hard work to do and why, you know, we, we can give useful information, but we're certainly not uh, as precise as, as we'd like to be. Do you think we're ever going to get to the day when the inputs you are able to put into your computer are so accurate and predictive of what will happen? I don't know. Is that, is, is that moment 10 years away where you could actually deliver this information to decision makers and say, you got to get in there because this thing's going to happen and here's how I know it? No, I, I actually, I don't think, not only will we not see that in my lifetime, I think that's uh, just inherently unattainable because the processes that produce these kinds of events are so complex and contingent um, that we'll never be able to forecast them, at least with any kind of serious, uh, you know, at lead time uh, ever. It's just too, com too complex of a system. What we can hope to do is just kind of keep marginally improving the models we're working with now. You know, now we can get uh, do a pretty good job identifying what the couple dozen countries around the world are that may be at, uh, at especially high risk. I think it's plausible that in, within my lifetime we might be able to get that down to a dozen uh, or something like that using new and better data. But we're we're never gonna we're never gonna be at the level of uh, of weather forecasting, for example, which people like to like to give them a hard time, but they're actually really good at what they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope you are too. And we thank you very much, Jay, for coming on TVO tonight and helping explain it to us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.